Hello, welcome to LUTV's look back at one of the finest seasons in the club's history. It's one I particularly remember well, especially the last home game of the season here at Elland Road. If the Don Revie reign was considered the most golden period in the club's history, then this was certainly the beginning of the second one. It's the second division championship winning season of 1989-1990. The previous season had seen the ultimate failure of former players attempting to replicate Reeve's achievements. Alan Clark, Eddie Gray and Billy Bremner had all tried, but the club hadn't had the success it craved. Leeds United found itself in its worst league position for 30 years. Changes were made. Howard Wilkinson was appointed manager in October 1988, replacing Billy Bremner. When Wilkinson arrived at Ellen Road, the club was struggling. Desolate. Desolate, didn't own the ground, didn't have a de decent training ground. Um, second bottom of the league, in debt, uh, not a lot of money. But all I saw was the opportunity, the opportunity uh, to manage a club that I thought genuinely could, could compete in the then first division. Wilkinson had previously had promotion success with Sheffield Wednesday. Dropping a division to manage Leeds, however, was seen by some as a gamble. He didn't see it like that. Before taking over, his extensive meetings with the Leeds board had only strengthened his resolve. Having got to know Leslie Silver as well as I had, and got to know how he felt, and got, to, and got him to understand what it was I wanted to do, and the vision I had, and where I wanted us to go, um, I, would just, I was just very, very confident that, that despite the problems, we could do what we set out to do. Wilkinson made some instant changes. He was a coach well ahead of his time in terms of attention to detail, in terms of diet and psychology, all important ingredients in the preparation for a game. He brought in new faces like Gordon Strachan and Chris Fairclough. Having finished 10th the previous season, it was time for more new faces like Vinnie Jones, John Hendry, Mel Sterland, Jim Beglin, Mickey Thomas, John McClellan and Chris O'Donnell. This completed the new intake, immediately dubbed in the press as the Magnificent Seven. Wilkinson had brought in one and a half million pounds in sales. He'd also spent three million pounds, so he knew, and everybody knew, now was time to deliver on his vision. I'd got the backing of, of Leslie, Bill Fotherby, Peter Gilman, and they were prepared, almost like a bank manager, to give me that overdraft, uh, to enable me to push through the things I wanted to do on the basis that we'd turn into profit soon. And, and that's what happened. I met Howard Wilkinson and, and Bill Fotherby at uh, an hotel on the M1. And the meeting went absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, I couldn't get a word in edge where we uh, messed the father with. I think Howard Wilkinson had just said, he says, right, these are the players I want. I'm going to make my holidays. You sort it, Bill. It's your job to get that done and dusted for me coming back for sort of pre-season. I would sold the club to me absolutely fantastic. Uh, he, he told me he was going to get some good players in, um, and he did do. He told me he was going to win the league, and we did do. And we come out of the car park at the hotel, and my wife said, "This is the this is the place to go." I was a wee bit insecure at the time. I was I was nearly thirty-two, and but the. Uh, the reassurance he gave me, and he gave me a remit of getting Leeds United back in the top division again. So I've never really had anybody saying, you must do this. It was a case, you must do it. And that was great, cause, because, you know, when you're a, a manager, to put that confidence, to actually say to a player and give them that confidence, 
uh, is reassuring um, for them, but for you as a manager, you must have some belief in them. I wanted to be part of the Leeds team that played in the top division again. You know, and, and that was the whole emphasis of why I came and why I wanted to be part of Leeds. You know, you, you, a massive club, underachieving in Division 2 as it was then. Um, but you only have to look at the ground, look at the, the, the scale of support and thought, well, you just get back up there, then anything can happen. The Kennigan sitting in the dressing room, all the players are in there. Uh, Mick told great stories. And he sat us all down. He said, Listen, do you want to be on that aeroplane? And we all looking. He says, I'm asking you, every one of you, do you want to be on that aeroplane? We all going, We're going away. We're going away. Where are we going? He says, Because this club's taken off, this aeroplane's taken off. He says, You just want to be on that aeroplane. And that's what he meant. We thought he meant we're going on holiday. He meant that Howard and his staff want to make this club great again. So oh, I wanted to be part of that. Wilkins's new signings couldn't guarantee success, but they would all play important and pivotal roles during the course of the season. And one of the new faces in particular attracted much interest. I made a lot of inquiries about Vinny. And sometimes, you know, you hear things and, uh, or, or you, you, you're presented with facts but you've also got to go by what you feel. And uh, my feelings were that th 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 this, this was a bloke who, there was more there than met the eye. His reputation came before him, particularly up in Newcastle because of his, of, uh, his days with, with Gaza, the famous photograph and everything else. But Vinny from day one, what a character he was. In my initial action, I went, oh no, I think he's useless. Uh, and then I got to know him, and then I got to like him, and then I got to enjoy playing with him. And then I, I realised what a big part of the group he was. I'm not saying we didn't, early doors, have to uh, um, just sort out a couple of things. Uh, but, but after that, as I said, there was no danger of him other than going out and playing and, and doing well. And actually becoming an, a, a footballer that surprised a lot of people, including many of his critics. He had good feet. He wasn't the most mobile of people. He was a fantastic trainer. Uh, and he was good with the group, and he scored a, a few good goals in that season. And I think he only got booked once, and that's phenomenal, you know. I think the fact that we had the likes of Gordon Strachan around him, um, and he wanted to impress them with his ability rather than just be, you know, sort of Vinnie Jones thug from Wimbledon sort of thing. I think, you know, he, he, he took it on board that there was, there was a chance here to do something different to what he had done before. His new teammates found that there were many sides to the new recruit. Jones would be an incredibly influential member of the team. You knew what you got from Vinny, he's an honest guy. He used to go out and he'd run through a brick wall for Leeds United and you know, you, you, you could see that in his attitude and his training and he worked hard. We did, a, a, I think, a, a sit-up test and it was a matter of honour that he didn't give in before anybody else. And then after everybody else had given in, he went on to do another hundred. You know, he had to be best at all the physical things uh, that, he, that he sort of tried to do. I remember reading a double page spread on Vinny. I've went from a builder to this. Well, this was, he was outside the house in Old Woodley, outside the gates of a house in Old Woodley. It wasn't his house. He was saying it was his house. So the board had delivered the players. Now it was up to Wilkinson to bomb them into a successful unit. First, he had to identify the nucleus of his team. But sometimes his methods were considered quite controversial. Howard split the dressing room by the ones he didn't want changed in a different dressing room, um, which was interesting because obviously I was still in the other dressing room, but a lot of people who I knew very, very well, you know, the John Styles, um, you know, the Dylan Kerrs and people like that in the other dressing room. So I used to pop down there, they used to shut the door, you can't come in here. You're with the big boys. So they, they instead of being nasty about it, they took it and um, joked about it where, hey, you boys can't come in our dressing room, stay up there. The only people that knew they were going to be part of it were the guys that were being brought in. Everybody else was a little bit on tenterhooks, a little bit worried about, obviously, their own position. And you know, it didn't matter who you were, you know, that was, that was the situation. It was a club, it was, it was living on the, 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 the reputations of uh, the Don Revy side. And, and um, 
the players that were there were behaving like top players and behaving like I would imagine the way that the top Revy players would behave and have the confidence and, and, and arrogance that goes with being a real top top side. But they hadn't earned that. They were they were they were playing all, they were they were they were leading footballers' lives off the back of other people who set the agenda twenty years previous. Yeah, I think there was something about eight or nine players came in throughout the whole squad, not just first team players, but he brought some 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 younger players in and squad players. And no, in, in pre-season there was a, almost a definite them and us and, and you definitely wanted to be one of them, <laughs> you didn't want to be one of us. When new manager comes in there's going to be changes and people are going to get pushed out so oh, you, can't, you can't complain about it because you've had your chance. You've had your chance, you've blown it, simple as that. It was one thing to bring players in but Wilkinson also knew he needed a strong captain to act as a link between himself and the rest of the dressing room. It was a major decision because he also needed somebody who shared his vision and for that he didn't have to look too far. Within a month of having him at the club it became clear to me that I'd got um, a first lieutenant on the pitch who actually understood where I was coming from, agreed with it and at times added his own little touches to it as well. He was one of the boys. He was great, um, but he's got a wicked tongue, as the guys in the press have seen since he's been in management. Um, one word can put you down. Um, and he, but he was, he, was, he was very, very good in the dressing room. He wasn't perceived by the players as being in Wilco's pocket. You know, he was his own man, and if he had something to say, he would say it. If he had something to say to Howard, then he would say that to Howard as well. Um, you know, he, he wasn't a puppet. For me, Gordon Strachan done more than anyone else for Leeds United uh, in their success at that time. If you look, I mean, uh, it, it's just his, his whole attitude to the game. I mean, that's why he played for so long at such a high level. Uh, total professional. Strachan was the best signing Howard made. A fiercely experienced footballer, Strachan was always going to demand respect on the pitch, but this was an exhaustive season. Strachan needed to bring the team together. He had many qualities and revelled in his new role. I was in a room with Gordon, two Scotsmen together, and Gordon says, you fancy a hot toddy? This is Friday night before the game. Fancy a wee hot toddy, do you want to get us to sleep? I said, yeah, go on then, Gordon, might as well. Might as well. I don't know, I'm not really into whiskey, but I have one, so Gordon, He's into the fridge, gets little miniature bottles of whiskey, puts a kettle on to boil the water, gets sugar, just fill the, fill the glasses up. And he's making a pot of tea as well. I thought, tea and hot toddy? I thought, Oof. not the ideal sort of appearance those two. So we sat there happily drinking our hot toddy to get us off. The next minute I see the empty uh, miniatures on the side in the teapot. Gordon starts filling the miniatures up with tea, puts the lids on and puts them back in the fridge. <laughs> that's, a, that's why you're Scotsman, they've got such bad names, I'll tell you. <laughs> Once a month, yeah, we'd, you'd organise him and Leslie, where all the players, the wives, the girlfriends, would all go, we'll have a meal together. Then after the meal, it would be, OK, my house is open. If you want to come, you can come back. If you don't, see you Monday. And uh, the older ones, like myself, um, who were, you know, with wives, would go back to Gordon's house. We'd have a little sing-song and um, a couple of beers. It was great. Younger boys would get themselves off into town. So, you know, he brought everything together, so in the dressing room, on the pitch, and away from the club. Fantastic. I took more on board because I had more responsibility, um, because how had asked that? from me and, and I took it on board and I could have easily stayed in the Manchester area but I up, moved, moved my house over, bought a new house in, in Scarcroft and got into schools there and done it properly. And because of that we had actually a decent social life with the lads to, to, we went about in a, as a group, all the, all the players that that group and, and, and that helped. That helped and winning helps more than anything else but we, little things helped and uh, so um, I enjoyed that responsibility and, and I enjoyed playing and from that they guys gave me an extra few years playing football because the, the reaction they, I got from them made me play longer. Things were now really starting to gel and Wilkinson believed he had all the elements for a successful team. We had a good squad, good players, you know, athletes, mixture of everything, you know, ball players, good defenders, 
players who could score goals, had really, really physical side. Injuries disrupted Wilkinson's plans as the team headed north to Newcastle for the opening day of the campaign. Vinnie Jones had picked up a knock and was joined in the treatment room by Chris Fairclough. Nonetheless, optimism was high, the team was good, they had a talismanic leader, and everybody thought already that this would be a clash of two of the title favourites. I remember going off the bus, I mean, I got a great, great response off the Geordie fans, I mean, uh, which I was grateful for. But just uh, prior to the match, uh, I mean, Jim Beglin hadn't even trained. Jim had a sort of a, he'd, he'd been out uh, with an injury, I think it was his knee at the time, and he'd just come back, done a couple of days training, and Jim just came along for a journey. Nothing else. Could have done a wee bit of training the day before. Well, uh, I, can't, I can't remember who went down injured. Uh, one of the lads went down injured in the morning or, or, or of the game, so Jim got, got thrown in a deep end. <laughs> it was a deep end as well, because I think it's fair to say, I mean, uh, we get tortured down that side. He might be good on ITV, ITV now, Jim, but I tell you what, if you'd been a commentator that day, he would have been caning himself. St James's Park was packed as over 24,000 watched Leeds on the opening day. But it was Newcastle who'd take the lead with Mickey Quinn's penalty. Then Leeds hit back, first of all, through Bobby Davison. And then shortly afterwards from a free kick, Ian Baird gets up and Leeds are ahead. I can remember me coming up the tunnel with a massive grin on my face, thinking, wow, this is great, this is unbelievable. You know, we'll cause right. <laughs> we are going to win league. 2 1 up, thinking, we've got a great chance. And the boy Quinn produced the magic. Included in the Leeds United defence were John McClellan and Jim Beglin, both for the very first time. They, along with everybody else, faced a torrid examination as the second half turned into a Mickey Quinn show. It was certainly a result which gave Leeds a rude awakening. Quinn scoring four of Newcastle's five goals in a shocking second half turnaround. Birdie had played with Quinny and he always said, best finisher I've ever seen. That's short. I was playing against my best mate, Mark McGee, he was in the Newcastle team that day. And uh, I remember after this, because I had to I promise that we'd go for some tea after it, Mark and myself with the wives. But I didn't enjoy myself, I just thought, oh no. It's going to be a long season. I didn't feel after the game, well, actually, I've got this totally wrong. I, I really, we ain't. After the game, I was still as confident. All the game gave me was a better idea of some of the players. Disappointing, not just for disappointing for the fans, uh, uh, for the players, disappointing for the fans as well, who's travelled up there, spent, again, good money. And, um, yeah, we, we got a kick up the backside, and I'll tell you what, Coming home that night wasn't the best bus in the world, I'll tell you, because Wilco were absolutely fuming. Despite the disappointment, Ellen Road was a sellout for the first home league game of the season. Middlesbrough had just been relegated, so offered Leeds an opportunity to get back on track. Confidence is a massive factor. No matter how well you've worked, how well knitted together you are, how many good players you've got, what the, con the expectations are, you still need to get results. The expectation level was massive. So as a result, I mean, it was, it was, the crowds were coming out in force, the kick-off had to be laid, and members of Wilco just coming in, right, just calm yourselves down, because you're getting all hyped up for the start of the game and everything else. Chris Fairclough was in the side, but Vinnie Jones was only named as a substitute. I mean, I think I'd, I had a volley just over a crossbar early doors in that match. I think it was, was it Bobby that scored, was it? Bobby Davis that scored. It was Leeds who had all the pressure. And so it was against the run of play when it was Middlesbrough who equalised. 
and Ellen Road feared what had happened before at Newcastle might happen again. Wilkinson, though, timed his substitution to perfection. And Vinny came on a sub. With about 10 minutes to go, he's run on, the crowd has roared, you know, and he's got this sort of marching sort of run comes on. It was like a gladiator going out into the arena and he's giving it the old get the arms up and everything else and with it. That just seemed to get the whole stadium up. So of course Vinny's sort of playing his through ball. And, and it was a shocker. It was a shocker that I passed it, to be honest with you. But of course it hit a divot. Went over Kevin Poole's arms into the goal. Well, we'd have thought Vinny scored the winning goal in the World Cup final. When people say you need luck, you'll get luck. It's when you get lucky. And we got lucky that night at a critical time. You know, we were a better team the morning after that game. Why? Simply because of the fact we got the result, we relieved a bit of pressure. We didn't particularly make our own luck at Newcastle, but having not got anything there, your first home game, you've got to get something. It was just great to get your first win in the season. Leeds fans have always been renowned for their vocal support, and this season their early backing would be absolutely crucial. Howard Wilkinson knew that, and he came up with an idea to actually increase the atmosphere. Indeed, when Joe Royal, the visiting older manager, came on a scouting mission, he described the atmosphere as a cross between a Hitler rally and the Colosseum. One of the things I suggested and was backed again was we'd get some microphones installed which picked up the crowd noise and actually uh, made sure that it, that it was magnified. The fans were just unbelievable. And I think if I speak to at least fans now, and they, they believe that the atmosphere in their games and that, that division that year was as good as anything. So it had been a solid enough start, and yet Leeds' results hardly suggested this was a team capable of challenging for the title. Vinnie Jones was again on the bench as Blackburn Rovers came to Ellen Road. Rovers had gone close to promotion the previous two seasons, being beaten in the playoff final. And once again, United went behind as Blackburn took an early lead. Downhearted, yes, beaten, no. Leeds piled on the pressure in search of an equaliser. But for a time, it looked as though it just wouldn't happen. Eventually, though, Wilkinson saw his new recruits finally combine to draw the sides level. Strachan, influential in the middle of the park, took the corner, and it was Chris Fairclough who powered it home. Once again, Leeds had to come from behind as Stoke went 1-0 up at the Victoria ground. Always a difficult place for Leeds to travel to. But Gordon Strachan's quick thinking brought him his first of the season and it was a share of the points. For the visit of Ipswich, Jones got his first home start and again the new signings made their mark. Strachan was revelling in his new role as he found Ian Baird and Jones netted his first goal for the club. The Leeds fans had taken Vinnie Jones to their hearts and the already cult figure was proving valuable in so many ways. Unfortunately though, Leeds couldn't hold Ipswich at bay. They hadn't yet demonstrated to their fans their belief that they were serious title contenders. It proved frustrating for the management as Leeds slumped to 12th in the league. After their victory at Hull, Leeds were only 9th in the table. Ian Baird scored the winner, but despite taking just 9 points from a possible 18, Wilkinson was unconcerned. In my mind, and I'd, I'd, I'd made sure the directors understood this, that our start might be a problem. But fortunately, once we kicked into gear, once the penny dropped, uh, we were away and running. And that result had been coming, really. At last, Leeds really got a chance to show their style. All their attacking qualities came to the fore, and the club to suffer was Swindon Town. They were totally outclassed. I think the players, and the coaching staff knew that somebody was going to get hiding. You know, we were going to get a lot of goals, and unfortunately, it was um, it was Swindon's turn. But we could have done that to um, many teams, in, you know, during the season. But Swindon were the were the first team to get get the hiding. 
Under 22,000 turned up at Ellen Road for the visit of Swindon, the lowest attendance of the season. John Henry showed the home fans just what they'd been missing with a wonderful display. His early skill and trickery just too much for the Swindon defence. Strachan took the spot kick away. It was exactly what the Leeds fans needed. And the Scot would go on to get a hat-trick, his second a rare header. And though I think there's only been about four in my career, I, get, I can remember that. Yeah, I think it came off the crossbar, you know. I think John Henry, uh, Happy Henry, um, he hit the crossbar, John. Uh, he was a threat, John, in the days. And I think it came off the crossbar and I, I, I headed him for a fair distance. My type of header, nobody near me. <laughs> Goalie on the ground. The third was a classic striker's goal from Bobby Davison. It was his third of the season and demonstrated not just the power of the man, but also fantastic accuracy. And it was Strachan who finished off the humiliation of Swindon. But if the scoreline was good, the drama wasn't over. John Hendry, who'd looked a class act all afternoon, was caught late on by Swindon's John Gittings. It was a bad tattle. Um, you know, I can just remember John Hendry going down and, and stretched off. And to, I went over to him and had a right go at him, the, 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 the centre half for Swindon. And all of a sudden, all these Swindon players come around me. But then the Leeds fan players come around me, and, you know, they were a massive brawl. But uh, yeah, that were a, a bad, bad tattle. I was pleased to have done that day, quite a good performance. I was my, building my fitness up and uh, growing in confidence. I remember in the second half, we were cruising. We were absolute cruising. I mean, we were sort of um, turning the screw. And the ball went up to, uh, to Gittins. And uh, the ball sort of came out of his feet. And it sort of landed right in the middle of us. So I'm going to just try and go in there and nick it. Well, he's come through and done me, has done me, caught me late. Uh, right late, and for a split second I thought, this is a, a nasty one here. Gittins was sent off, but for the constantly improving Hendry, it looked a serious injury. It was, yeah, it was a disgraceful tackle. Absolutely disgusting it was, and uh, that was me, just stretched off, stretched off, and I thought, I'll fear the worst with this one, but we'll see how we go with it. If you lose a player of John's um, ability then, you know, it does affect you. It does affect the manager, you know, and how he, how he's, he picks his team. But I think, um, I think it's a case of, you know, you get injured, somebody takes your place. And hopefully that person who comes in and takes your place does a, um, a good job. The Leeds fans who'd witnessed Hendry being stretched off in the previous game must have been both amazed and relieved to see his name on the team sheet for the visit of Oxford just four days later. The lead side was looking more settled now, with Gordon Strachan orchestrating things from midfield. Bobby Davison was also in great form, and he it was who met Strachan's corner to give Leeds the lead. The well-worked free kick, with Strachan picking out Ian Baird for the flick on, caused panic. Wilkinson's painstaking preparation was paying off. And that lead was extended with a fantastic free kick from Mel Sterling. His first goal of the season, and it wouldn't be the last time Leeds fans would be celebrating a Sterling dead ball strike. As South African Mark Steen scored a consolation goal for Oxford, John Henry was struggling. In the 90th minute of that game against Oxford, I'm sort of uh, uh, putting extra stress on my left leg to, to keep this the stress off my right leg, and as a result, it was a compensatory injury. I ruptured my thigh in the 90th minute. It was as if someone had stabbed me. So I thought, oh, what have we done here? I just carried on playing because it was the last minute. But I knew I was in, uh, I knew I'd something, done something drastically wrong. As a result of that win at Oxford, Leeds climbed to fourth in the table. They put together three consecutive wins, which is exactly what they needed. But it became evident that John Henry's injury was quite a serious one. John had been influential. He was in sparkling form, so the team was obviously going to miss him. And at Port Vale, it showed they drew nil-nil. Frustrating, to say the least. 
disappointing in one of them because you hadn't experienced uh, being out a lengthy time with, with injury. It's just, you ask any footballer, it's their worst nightmare when, when they're out injured because it's just, you're just like a caged tiger. With no top division games, the eyes of the country were on Leeds United's trip to London to face newly relegated West Ham United at Upton Park and this was always going to prove a yardstick for Wilkinson and his players.